for the benefit of others in the audience, the question is about the internet currently as it's configured is basically unregulated. It's kind of an open space. And the question is, is in the future, do they see that this will become regulated? And is that necessarily a good thing or, or and how we might go about it if that kind of captures the question? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to have to be. We'll put it that way. Um, and it's not going to be regulation as we've seen before. How we typically talk about regulation, right? We usually typ typically talk about regulation as the government comes in, does these things. But, you know, the corporations that are shaping, you know, digital spaces, because it's not even like the internet, it's everywhere, um, are powerful, powerful entities. So it does require other kinds of powerful entities to come in and check that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be top down. And in fact, a lot of scholars have argued it can't be, right? It's a different kind of issue. It's a public space issue, right? Like how do we bring it back into the commons when it's been pushed in this privatized space? Um, and so a lot of scholars have thought about this and they've called it responsive regulation. They've talked about it in relation to major financial issues, like big, big social problems. And their argument is we need to think about other kinds of actors and incentives that can rein these spaces in, for lack of a better word, so that we can actually balance the distribution of benefits. So I think it's going to have to happen. Um, and I think those corporations are going to have to be part of that process. And it's not just going to be the government of Canada coming in or another kind of government coming in. It's going to have to be a multi-stakeholder process. It, because it's going to happen regardless. I think I kind of think my goal or other scholars' goal is to bring more stakeholders at that table because we've seen already what can happen when powerful actors are the ones shaping it and it's not very democratic. Question over here. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is in regards to how we're being kind of conditioned to think certain ways. And I'm thinking the long term. So things go really bad. And we are seeing, like, I'm thinking films like Mad Max and post-apocalyptic kind of novels and things like that. Um, there's not very many examples of how we can bounce back if things take a turn for the worse. And do you think that that's part of the, the rhetoric or the narrative that governments are trying to kind of scare us into saying, yeah. you want the status quo, even though that means you're at the hands of the corporations and so on. Um, and the last piece is when things do take a turn for the worse, the people who find themselves gripping the reins of power out of those often violent struggles uh, often don't have the betterment of the, the, the larger population uh, in, in, their, uh, in their minds. So I'm just kind of curious about reactions as to what happens when things go bad, the doomsday clock gets closer, climate change. <laughs> yeah. You know. uh, I guess if the doomsday clock ever struck midnight, I mean, there wouldn't be anybody there to, to do the, <laughs> the uh, advancement. <laughs> You know, that's an interesting idea that, that these movies that you're talking about are, are sort of sent out as cautionary tales to chasten us into thinking, well, you know, you think you got it bad under us, look what could happen. So I don't see them that way. However, I see them as sort of prefigurations or kind of the residue of the popular imagination as it contemplates, you know, the worst case scenarios that are embedded in our world. I mean, we can, we know about the, we've seen plenty of movies that, that show uh, nuclear war. That's a real um, thing, and, and the movies sort of represent what that might look at, look at, uh, look like. I think many of these Armageddon or apocalyptic movies, whether they're zombies or Mad Max or so on, are picking up on the general anxiety we have as a civilization about the limits of, of w what we can do. Um, now, you know, I guess your question goes, what, what do we do after we, we crash in, if it does happen, and we crash into some hard scrabble existence in the outback, you know? Um, it seems as if these authoritarian regimes and all the sort of bad demons in history pop up as the figures who are running things. And I, and I guess, again, this is w sort of what we want to avoid is that kind of authoritarianism, that return to kind of a tribalism, big man way of running uh, our, ourselves politically. And so all, all I can say is that, yeah, now is the time for politics because we, we are 
at a crisis of democracy in some ways too around the world. We see these retrograde figures like Trump coming in and they become the answer for many people with these anxieties for how to negotiate the difficult times ahead. They looked to these strong leader types. That's absolutely the worst thing you can do. We need, as I say, more than ever, democratic institutions that represent people and their real concerns, you know, working hard to solve these problems that, you know, are, are, are coming at us. So I don't know whether that quite answers your question, but some thoughts. Hey, so my, um, my question mostly uh, follows on that. It's mostly addressed to Andy, but I'd be curious to hear all of your thoughts. So you spoke a lot about hope um, as kind of something that I guess leads us into this sort of state of ignorance that doesn't really lead to action. You know, we, we hope in some technological imaginary solution. Um, you seem to be, I don't know if you're kind of calling for some fear or shock, um, but I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Like I think yeah. we know a lot of examples where, you know, like we actually need a call for radical hope in the right. face of like challenges right. or, you know, hopelessness or fear can actually be debilitating in certain yep. situations. So I'm wondering if that's just sort of a wake-up call or like, you know, you know, moving forward, what kind of sort of cognitive, emotional, behavioral configurations, like is that, I don't know if you've done research on that or what you're yeah. kind of yeah. working towards there. Yeah, read my book. I, I answer all this. <laughs> but I mean, that, that, that's a, you're very observant about what I was saying. Hope is something that we all consider, generally speaking, a positive thing. I mean, Bill Clinton was the man from hope. Uh, Obama, you know, the audacity of hope. Oprah touts hope all the time. Hope is what we need. Keep hope alive. Um, hope in unseen rescuers is what I'm against. Um, you, you might all know the story of Pandora's box, more properly Pandora's jar. This old uh, myth said that Pandora, curious about what was in the box, opened it and out flew all the evils of the world. She, she was able to tamp the box down just in time and the one thing remaining was hope. So it's sort of a, a, a message that, you know, even when things are bad, maintain hope. But another translation of what that was that was retained in the box is actually um, deceptive expectations. And that's what I consider happens when you cling too much to this, as you mentioned, Pollyanna, this kind of idea that things will work out, which is associated with hope, a kind of knee-jerk optimism. And I think we've all, as I suggested, have been tutored in that kind of thinking for years and years, and it's very helpful in a lot of ways from an individual perspective to have hope. But as kind of a societal regime, it, it lulls us into expecting this kind of deus ex machina, some savior from above. And so if you give up hope, some people say, you know, terminal patients, sometimes if they, they have no hope, they actually start living again. They actually start saying, what have I got to lose? I'm gonna apply myself in the remaining time to all of the things that I wanted to do, to make good on my promises to myself. And I think we're at that point as a society where we have to say, you know, things do not look good, but we have to throw ourselves, everybody does, especially young people who kind of are fatalistic, I think, the ones I see often about these problems. They've got to know that the older generations are, you know, putting their money where their mouths are and trying to do whatever they can to make the world safe for them. And that's the problem. I think we're headed into an unsafe regime if you want to sort of describe it that way. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we know it's not going to be as safe as it is now. Thank you. Others want to join? Alexander? I see a lot of knee-jerk pessimism in the last few years, and sometimes I find that exhausting. Yeah. And, and so I caution against going the other extreme. So hope is good, but it needs to be moderate, just like pessimism has to be moderate. And there are all sorts of reasons why it's been up-tempo as of late, and I think you can f figure out those reasons. But it, it is exhausting, and it's sometimes unfortunate when I see other scholars engage in it. I'm not saying anyone here. I'm just speaking strictly from my own, Go ahead. My own on epistemic community in international relations where, you know, there, you know, when Trump said, let it be an arms race, I saw all these nuclear security experts, oh, how dare he say that? But it's like, well, you should know that this actually has been uh, American strategic policy since the 1940s, essentially since Pearl Harbor. Um, so it, 
I think it's important to also have a historical sense as to what's going on. I think sometimes we're, we think a lot of things are new when they're really not. Uh, and so it's important to see, well, okay, there is political polarization, but we've been here before. Certainly in the United States, they had a civil war. That's how polarized it was in the 1850s, 1860s. Um, so I just think that we have to take a bit of a broader perspective hopefully ground our perspective in some sort of theory or some careful analysis so that we don't get too carried away in our pessimism so that our hope remains grounded as well. But keep in mind that what you've said is sort of part of that thought pattern I'm talking about. That, that idea that we've been here before. People have always said the world is ending. The sky is always falling. We've been through this before and we came through. We're at a different kind of moment, though, I think, now, where the kinds of pressures, the contradictions of being a, a huge dominant species on, an, on a finite planet are starting to bite. And it's not like this is just sort of a moment like any other. It's different. It's, it's different scale. So that's, that's kind of my thought. I would just say yeah. very quickly, you have to identify what exactly is different. Right. So certainly there are things that are cyclical and there are things that exhibit a lot more continuity than change. But I think it's, a, it's upon us as scholars or even as informed citizens who say, well, this is actually what's different. This is what's really concerning. I am very scared about some things like human geno genomics, for instance. You mentioned the gene editing. That yeah. terrifies me. Because we're introducing into the human gene pool things that should not be in there. Um, and that is certainly different. Um, the technology is nascent. And because of that, we don't understand these implications. Uh, so certainly, I'm no Pollyanna, but I think it just behooves us to be careful in terms of thinking like what exactly is new and what is not. Okay. Nope, I won't. Oh. <laughs> I'll let it end. <laughs> uh, so I have a, I have a very uh, practical question. Um, so as an individual tech worker, for instance, in one of these large corporations or in the government or in, um, you know, et cetera, uh, what can we do as a, as a kind of a low-level um, person in this big corporate machine, kind of a one cog? How do we, uh, wh where can we get the resources to help us um, kind of push that change, push the envelope that we are like the leaders of these, these industries to see, um, but granted we have no power? Yeah, yeah, I'm really empathetic on that front. Um, well, anytime you want to chat, I'm around. <laughs> um, and I should say, as someone that worked in political campaigns, it's amazing what the working class can do when they start speaking and they start recognizing. I mean, like, to really reform tech, right, we need to, we need to change the training. We need to change who's in those organizations. We need to change much more than just bringing in a, you know, diversity inclusion person that gets a big salary to come in and make the company runs slightly differently, right? We need to have like a much broader think through, which is something that we as individuals probably can't do, but we can certainly start building coalitions. Like if you want activist groups that are concerned around this or research projects with community members, I can give you a list of resources. Everything's online, everything's public. The, um, there was a huge tech justice um, nonprofit backed um, event in New York City that was raising a lot of these issues. The Canadian organization that I highlighted here, they're all trained computer scientists. They'd be happy to have chats. They've designed tech to, for privacy. They're very open. It's all publicly accessible. They'd be happy to chat. So I guess one, have hope. Two, we're empathetic to what that, we all occupy spaces that are really difficult. Um, but the fact is that you wanted to ask the questions so that there are others that want to have that conversation too. And we can't push it up from the ground up. So thanks for the question. Okay. I, um, I don't have a question either. Yeah. Uh, the word hope is used a lot this evening and I continually, as I, as I carry on with the Third Age Learning Series at Rim Park, and I went to another, another uh, presentation today about the climate crisis and the ethics involved in dealing with that, I really, I, I, one, of the, um, one of the gems I got out of th one of the three sessions I've been to so far is, or four of them, is uh, 
Thomas Homer Dixon's uh, uh, speaking of his upcoming book, book, which may well end up being titled Commanding Hope, which I find so powerful. And I think that when we sit in positions like you do up here, and when we sit in these positions here in, the, in, in this uh, theater, that it's our duty to command hope. And in commanding that, we are not coming from a place of naivety, um, uh, shallowness, but a place of being astutely searching and, and discerning and coming to events like this so that, that as we move forward in this crisis and confluence of all of these things that you've spoken about tonight, we can act more deeply rooted in our convictions because the shit's coming down. And my grandchildren are gonna be facing this. My children are gonna be facing this. I may well live to see it continue to come down. So command it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that, yeah, that's well said. I think, uh, you know, one of the things about Thomas Homer Dixon was that he, well, he, he understands these issues very well. And uh, he has, you know, smuggled a little bit of hope in some of his books by imagining that out of these crises, out of these breakdowns, actually something new and conceivably better will come. And that is uh, a touchstone of a lot of writers who write about sort of post-climate change and post-peak oil, things of that nature, that out of the ashes of this present sort of unsustainable society could, some, could come something better. Now, for me, obviously, that is you know, the hope metaphor working its way in, the optimism reflex. But I, I do acknowledge, and I, I'm very interested in to hear more about commanding hope, so I'll look for that. Thanks, Chris. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk to all three of you. Uh, so something that I uh, noticed or thought about, um, so something about the doomsday clock is that uh, it's inherently very future focused, I think. And whatever the issue may be that you're interested in, I was just wondering what you had in mind about um, arguments or strategies to overcome people who would just say to you, I don't care. Um, so I think obviously people in this audience, are like we're here because we care about these issues, so it's easy to convince us or motivate us, but for the most part, for any of these changes to happen, you need to motivate people, and for the most part, a lot of people don't want to deal with these things. So what kind of like, strategies or thoughts do you have in mind to change that? Well, I would just, you know, one of the things that's different about the, the climate crisis than the nuclear crisis and some past uh, crises is that those in some ways could be handled by a managerial class. It didn't matter what other people thought in the general population about nuclear weapons. There was a coterie of scientists and military industrialists and politicians who were kind of taking care of it, were managing it. The problem with climate change is that it really is, uh, you know, it's incumbent on everybody uh, because the managerial class doesn't really want to handle it. They want to kick it down the road. That's what they're doing, and they have been doing it for 30 years. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly uh, any better than I said it in the, in the in the talk is that it is a problem of persuasion and the people who aren't here are the ones who need to be persuaded most of all, right? Yeah. I've always thought that maybe it would take some amazing event, some cataclysmic thing, the Greenland ice shelf slides off into the ocean, it sloshes Europe out of existence. Maybe it would take that kind of thing before people would do that. But, but how perverse is that thinking that you're waiting for the worst to happen before you can do something about it? So if you've got any ideas about how to persuade those people who aren't here, let me know. Okay. No, just from, just because I mentioned regulation earlier, I mean, regulatory scholars have argued it takes that kind of catastrophe. Like, why are airplanes so safe? It's because we had horrific things happen. It's safer to fly than it is in a car. Unfortunately, it does horrific environmental damage if we all do that, right? So... I think you're right, the climate problem is something that's fundamentally different than the other kinds of problems that we've talked about, and it has to be future-oriented, whereas the talk around technology, I tried to deliberately ground it in something contemporary, 
But again, it's also contributing to the bigger thing, and I actually think what you spoke about is the bigger thing we should all be talking about. Technology is part of that, but it's because it's contributing to that, in part because it's contributing to those problems. Okay. Yes, Chris. Hi. Uh, I had a question uh, involving demilitarization. Um, and like, there's so many places around the world with these massive armies and nuclear warheads, but what's the point of having them if you never actually use them? And do you think we could actually convince, say, these massive world powers to all get rid of their nuclear power at the same time, and do you think that would ever possibly work out? Well, the point of having a nuclear arsenal is not to use it. <laughs> that, that's the paradox of nuclear arsenals. They're, uh, at least fundamentally, they work best when you don't use them. They work every day. We use nuclear weapons every day, and we being the United States and Great Britain, uh, as, as the nuclear-armed uh, states in the Western Alliance, uh, they're used for deterrence. And no country with nuclear weapons has been invaded and, um, at a large scale. Sure, there might be some provocations at lower ends of uh, violence, like between Pakistan and India, but the reason why countries have nuclear weapons, in part, is uh, not to use them. Another, part, another reason is simply that if they've give up their nuclear weapons, there's no assurance that they might have that another country would give up nuclear weapons. So they're caught in this dilemma of sorts. No one wants to have nuclear weapons, but because the other side has it, then you have to have it, because it sort of cancels out the effect of them having it. But no one wants to, uh, to uh, give up uh, voluntarily those nuclear weapons precisely because they feel that doing so would make them vulnerable to blackmail and other sorts of depredations. So, uh, on top of that, we have, um, like, chemical warfare has been banned all around the world. And when it has been used, there's been, like, bad sanctions about countries who have done it, and it's a very negative thing. So, could we worldwide ban nuclear weapons? There have been efforts, uh, but most countries that have some stake in nuclear weapons simply would not abide by any sort of agreement. They would pay some lip service, mm -hmm. as in the case of Japan, which mm -hmm. uh, is famous for its uh, non-nuclear um, attitudes and predispositions, but they depend on U the U.S. nuclear arsenal, so they never really take it too, too seriously themselves. Okay. You know, and, and incidentally, this is, this is why I have such uh, a different view of Trump uh, than, than you appeared to have, because what that aberrant person said, one of the first things he's quoted as saying in his discussions about the nuclear arsenal of the United States is, why do we have them if we can't use them? So the, the understanding of it as a deterrent is something that's like so many other things probably escapes him. And so I see, I see him as particularly... But that's, the, that's, but that's the paradox, because you have to leave open the possibility that nuclear weapons will be used in a conflict. If there is such a thing as the nuclear taboo, and some scholars allege that there is such a thing, then that throws into question the very existence of, or workability of nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence cannot work in a world where the nuclear taboo exists. So he might have been aberrant in expressing that out loud, not once, in fact, um, but, uh, but you know, the US military, and other militaries for that matter, do make plans uh, for their use. Um, they just know that in polite company, you don't say these things out loud. Yeah, and just to add maybe the, the hopeful spin, um, we rarely look or talk about institutions of spaces as hope, but I'd say like in that case, and I never talk about the US government as having hope in it, but the people that occupy the bureaucracy and the level of pushback to the Trump agenda, and this is... <laughs> I should just disclose, I have family that work in the Department of Energy. The level of pushback that I know I can't understand, that I know they've articulated, is incredible. And so, while we, again, while we don't look to institutions for hope, and this might be one space where now that we do see these kinds of collapsing of norms, we do see institutions pushing back and doing what they're intended to do. Um, so, maybe that's... We do see galvanizing of hope in spaces where we wouldn't necessarily think that we see resistance. Thank you. And we have time for one last question. Okay. Um, so what do you think about the um, idea that mutually assured destruction can allow for superpowers to basically say, I'm going to do whatever I want close to my border 
because you're probably not going to care enough about that yeah. to launch a nuclear attack on me because then I'll do it on you and sort of maybe the context of like Russia and the Ukraine situation. Uh, yeah, so there is a lot of debate about exactly what role uh, the nuclear balance plays in all of this. Um, it's complicated, and not least because, again, we just have no data. Nuclear weapons have never been used uh, for the reasons I described earlier in my presentation. With regards to things like Ukraine, so certainly Russia did engage in nuclear signaling over the course of 2014. Test fired ICBMs. It, sort of puts, it puts some forces on alert over the course of, of, uh, of uh, that spring. I'm not sure how much attention that really got even amongst policymakers in DC. They were confused just in general uh, about what was happening within Ukraine, let alone what Russia was doing in Ukraine. Um, so it was in a way what we would say overdetermined, uh, meaning the reason why the United States and its allies might have been hesitant to um, respond forcefully to Russian aggression over Crimea, simply that they did not know what to do, uh, they were caught off guard, uh, Russia has nuclear weapons, Russia seems to have much, much more familiarity with Ukraine domestic politics, uh, the Ukraine government was new and was doing some things that made some people unsettled. A lot of things are going on. But it is true that mutually sure destruction sort of suggests that states can mind their own business within their own backyard that they can do so with impunity. The question, however, is why would they do so? Because uh, they already have uh, security assured just by virtue of having these nuclear weapons. But then you can talk about other factors at play as well. Well, thank you. So, so, yeah, one, one more, please. Okay. Um, uh, if I could, for the benefit of the rest of you guys, the question was, what is the most likely, what is more likely, biological warfare or nuclear warfare? Well, I think we've seen already biological warfare. I mean, there was a subway attack in the 1990s in Japan that had the, had, had the trappings of biological warfare, but it was perpetrated by a terrorist organization. I would say that biological warfare is already being conducted by the human race on the rest of the planet. Uh, yeah. Insect populations, the total biomass is yeah. down 60, 70 percent in some places on the earth. Not what you meant, but an answer. <laughs> I actually agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, we're out of time now. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Just to reassure you that there is hope and that one can still hold on to hope. I do remind you we live in a province dominated by Leafs fans. So on that note, thank you so much for coming out.